These ones are important. Okay, so today, uh, besides outlining what the project will be, I will talk about. Um, I will. So we talked about these coin flips, and I said that generalizing coin flips to variables that have more than one value is easy, and that's what we're going to do in a couple of slides. And you'll see that all the theory, everything we learn applies to it. And just by using these concepts of uh, uh, that we've uh, t uh, talked about before, Bernoulli and beta distributions or in this case the extensions to more than two values, the multivariate extensions which are the Bernoulli and excuse me and the categorical distribution, you'll see that we can already build classifiers and in fact we can go and build applications and we can build some really cool applications out there. Okay. Revision, you probably don't need this revision because you've all studied this, uh, plenty of this last week. Um, if we have a, a variable that's binary, the likelihood can be represented in terms of a, a Bernoulli distribution where N1 is the number of times the, the, say the coin was 1 and N0 the number of times that the variable took the value of 0. And that's just simply uh, this Bernoulli distribution that we have here. I'm using this uh, curly D to basically represent um, X1 in this case to N, all the data. Okay, so sometimes I will write X1 to N and sometimes it's easier to just put a D there and say that's the data. The probability of the data given the parameters is just a Bernoulli distribution. We also learned that the natural prior for the Bernoulli distribution was the beta distribution. So the beta distribution allows us to encode our beliefs about what the value of theta will be. And theta is between 0 and 1. So we know that theta is a probability. And so theta, in, in, in fact, just in, in this case encodes the probability of um, x being equal to 1. At 1 minus theta, the probability of x being equal to 0. So in a probabilistic setting, beliefs, our personal beliefs are described by probability distributions. And we learned that in order to do Bayesian inference, one doesn't do optimization. One uh, and one doesn't believe that there is one only value of theta one uses this notion that there is a subjective prior that encodes the beliefs, P of theta, and then one multiplies the prior times the likelihood and normalizes to get the posterior distribution, which in this case is also beta distribution. When the prior and the posterior have the same form, like in this case the prior is beta, the posterior is beta, um, we say that um, the, the prior is conjugate uh, to the likelihood. So the word conjugate is often used in books and that just means that if you start with a prior of type X, you multiply it by a likelihood, your posterior is also of type X. Okay, so we've seen two cases of this already. This case where the prior is beta, the posterior is beta. And what was the other case? the Gaussian case. So if you have a Gaussian prior on theta in linear regression, the posterior is also Gaussian. The posterior on theta is also Gaussian. We didn't do the variance, but for the variance there is a similar result. If the variance is, um, for the variance we use a distribution called the inverse gamma that is just like a Gaussian but it only allows for positive values because variances can only be positive. Um, and so this is something that it would be a short exercise for you guys to actually do this. Um, you use the inverse gamma prior, you multiply, and then the posterior is inverse gamma. Okay. The one that I want to talk about today is the extension of the beta distribution and the extension of the Bernoulli distribution. Um, let's start with the extension of the Bernoulli distribution. So this is going to be called the categorical distribution. And, and I use the word categorical instead of the what's 
the generalization of it, which is the multinomial, because um, I think it's more natural. It's just basically saying something is either of this of category X or category Y or category Z. So we're categorizing data. How do we do this? Now, let's assume we have n data points. Let's try to get the formal setting. We have n data points. Okay, so x1 to n is our entire data set. And each xi will take k values. In particular, if, oh, I should have said here, if k equal 3, then the possible x's that you could have are 1, 0, 0, so class 1, or 0, 1, 0, or 1, or uh, 0, 0, 1. Let me write this actually here. So xi is equal to either uh, 1, 2, or 3. 1 basically gets represented as class 1, 0, 0. 2 as 0, 1, 0. And 3 as 0, 0, 1. Okay. So we're just using a binary encoding um, to represent each number. Okay. And the 1 appears in the position the one will appear in the position where, that, where the variable is on. Okay. Does this make sense? Because the rest of the lecture I'm going to use this encoding. Uh, why is it called multivariate? There's only one variable. Pardon? Oh, if, in this case, um, xi can take <coughs> several values. That's why I'm actually using. Okay. And I'm going to have more than one xi. So in which case, I could think of the distribution over x1 to n actually as a single multinomial. Which I'll come back and I'll show you a, okay. a very specific example of why that is the case. Why are you using three? We can store three in like two-bit data, right? Pardon? We can store number three numbers in a two-bit data, right? We can have 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. But why are you doing that? Yeah. I'm writing it like this, not for storage consideration, but for explanation. Um, how we store it, we will be able to store it efficiently without having to represent all these zeros. So if it went from 1 to n, or if there was n values, then it would be the n value would be in the 1 would be in the n position, and everything else would be 0? That's correct. Okay. If you have, but let's leave n to indicate number of data points, and let's use k to indicate the number of values that the variable could take. So if k is a million and, and uh, x happens to be 999, you basically have a vector of a million zeros with a 1 in position, uh, what did I say, 999. Okay, so of course when we implement this, we're not going to be storing vectors with millions of zeros and a 1 at a position. We'll just store the location of the 1. Um, but in order to explain this to you, uh, write the math, um, let's assume that we have a vector of zeros and a one in the position that's on. So our space here is partitioned. We don't allow, for example, a 0 0.5, 0 0.5. It's either that's it's correct. partitioned to one of k different. Uh, that's correct. There's no soft. You can't belong to two. You are either one or the other. Um, that's going to be uh, uh, how I'm going to construct this. And so then I'm going to say that the categorical distribution for variable xi will be the product from uh, j equal 1 to big K of theta j to the indicator variable of x i j equal <coughs> 1. Okay. Now, let's see why this is the case. Why this definition makes sense. If I have a vector, let's say that um, let's say that I have x i equal zero zero one, 
in this example. Okay. So in this case, probability of xi given the vector theta would be equal to theta 1 to the power 0 because xi x i 1 is 0, x i 3 is equal to 1, so that's just theta 3. So this is exactly what we did with the, how when we introduced the Bernoulli distribution. Okay. This is just a simple compact way using the product of saying that the probability of xi being equal to 1 is theta 1, the probability of xi being equal to 2 is theta 2, and the probability of xi being equal to 3 is theta 3. Okay. And then we'll then add one more condition, which is theta 1 plus theta 2 plus theta 3, they must be equal to 1. So the last theta should always be 1 minus the sum of the previous thetas. So in other words, theta k is always equal to 1 minus the sum from j equal 1 to k minus 1 of theta j. Now if you choose k equal 2, you see that this is the Bernoulli distribution because theta 2 um, in this case would be 1 minus theta 1. So, we, so it's just 1 minus theta. So you choose theta 1 equal theta and then theta 2 is just 1 minus theta. Okay, and so this is the categorical distribution. So it basically says what is the probability that you belong to each of the categories? What is the probability that you belong to each of the boxes? So what is the probability that um, you're a Republican or a Democrat, say? <coughs> when we have several data points, if we assume that these, the data are IID, that they all come from the same distribution, in this case, uh, categorical distribution, and if we assume that they're independent, then we can just multiply them. So this whole probability would just be the probability from i equal 1 to n times the probability from j equal 1 to k of theta j i indicator of um, the variable being 1. So that's how I write my likelihood. Once I have a likelihood, you know how to compute theta. Take the log, differentiate, equate to zero. We're going to do this in the next class. I'm not going to do the maximum likelihood estimate for today. Instead, I'm going to move on to um, an application of this. All right, so the probability, um, oh, I should have said here of xi equal 3. Sorry about that. So for the example, the probability of xi equal 1 given theta is just equal to theta 1. The probability of xi equal 2 given theta is just equal to theta 2 and so on. So the probability of xi being any class is just theta, it's just that theta. And so when we're given data, we're going to try to estimate theta. So think of a, like let's go beyond the coin. Now let's think of a die. You you toss it many times and it can be k is equal to 6 is one of those 6 values and so if you want to know the probability of 6 you just count how many times 6 came up and you divide by the number of time you actually threw the dice. Okay, so. Just like we had a beta distribution we're going to have a generalization of the beta distribution which is, as you would have expected, it will just look like the beta distribution. 
So recall that the beta was theta times 1 minus theta and then through these parameters alpha and beta. Um, in this case we're just going to assume that there's k possible values that the variable could take and then we're just going to take theta to a variable and instead of having alpha and beta and gamma and all of these variables we're just going to call them all alpha and introduce an index k. Okay, so recall that the beta the beta was um, proportional to theta to the alpha 1 minus 1 and 1 minus theta to the alpha 2 minus 1. So that was a beta distribution. A Dirichlet distribution looks just like the beta distribution except that now instead of going only up to two values, we're going to go up to k values. We're going to multiply k thetas. I'm seeing some faces, I see people sleeping, I see people with faces of horror, I see people laughing and I see people on the laptops. Um, this is the time to ask questions. The rest of the lecture as well as in order to understand neural networks we're going to be using this notation ad nauseum. This is the beginning of the second part and this is very key. Um, that's correct. Okay. So for um, let's look at an example. For a beta, k is the number of variables, the number of possible uh, outcomes. Sorry. So for a coin, k is two, your head or your tails. For the die, k is six. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. Okay, so k indicates all the possible values the variable could take. Okay, so for a coin, we use a beta distribution, uh, beta prior, and the beta prior is essentially it's this. Uh, there's only one theta, and the reason why there's only one theta is because I know that I could also write this, let me actually write it like alpha 1 minus 1, times theta 2 to alpha 2 minus 2. So I could write it like this, but then it must be understood that theta 1 is the probability of heads and theta 2 is the probability of tails, and so we know that they have to add up to 1, because the coin is either heads or tails. So in a way, if I write theta 1 and theta 2, I'm over-parameterizing them. And so that's why when I explain beta, I actually just use one single value of theta. Because once I know the probability of heads, I know that the probability of tails is just 1 minus theta. Now, um, so that's the beta. Let's look at the Dirichlet for the, uh, for the die. So there I would have theta 1 to um, alpha 1 minus 1, theta 2 to the alpha 2 minus 2, theta 3, alpha 3 minus 3, Theta 4 to the alpha 4 minus 4. Wait, isn't it all minus 1 to minus 1? Sorry, minus 1, sorry. Okay. Glad to hear you guys following it. Theta 5 to the alpha 5 minus 1. And then the last one, I don't need actually to write, I could just write theta 6 to the alpha 6 minus 1 to make it easier. But I know that they all have to sum to 1, so this last one is 1 minus theta 1 minus theta 2 minus theta 3 minus theta 4 minus theta 5 to the alpha 6 minus 1. Because we know that the last one is the one that guarantees that everything sums to 1. And of course, each theta is between 0 and 1. Each theta is a probability. So now that also has a normalizing constant which is this ratio of gamma distributions just like the beta distribution we don't need to worry about it because we can do all our analysis without knowing it. Okay, someone once worked out this for us we don't need to bother with it. Someone actually in class went and did this by actually someone actually did this derivation proved that the integral of this 
is this gamma function. And it's actually a simple integration by parts exercise. But this is not a calculus course, so I'm not going to ask you to do that. OK, so that's the setup. Um, you can be one of k values. And then you can also put a beta prior on that. So now, just like we had done before, and let's bring the revision here. So before I had a beta prior, and I had a Bernoulli likelihood. And then what I did is I multiplied the beta prior times the Bernoulli likelihood, and I derived the beta posterior. Right now, I'm going to do the same analysis, but instead of using a beta and a Bernoulli distribution, I'm going to use a categorical distribution and a Dirichlet distribution. Okay, so we're going from coins to dice. And I'll argue that if you can do dice, you can actually do a lot of applications on the web. Certainly, all of text analysis opens to you. The idea of doing text analysis on the web um, becomes uh, very accessible once you know this. So the posterior of theta, given all the data, x1 to n, is proportional to the data, x1 to n given theta, <coughs> times um, the prior. And that's going to be proportional. And now I'm going to, the data are assumed to be independent. So it's the product from i equal 1 to n. And then the product from j equal 1 to k of theta j, indicator of x i j being equal to 1. OK, that's just the likelihood. times the product from j equal 1 to k of theta j to the alpha j minus 1. And I don't want to make the notation too heavy, so I'm not going to be saying all the time that the theta j's have to be between 0 and 1, and that the, 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 the thetas have to add up to 1. Okay, so I will assume that we all are on the same page. The thetas are, each theta is the probability of one of the k classes. And you, you can only be, when you add up over all the k classes, you have to get one. Okay. And so this is equal to the probability from j equal 1 to k of theta j. And I'm, now I'm going to write this as n j times the probability from j equal 1 to k of theta j to the alpha j minus 1. where nj is the sum from i equal 1 to n of i x i j equal 1. So basically, it's the number of times you had a 1 in position j. So capital for the dice, for example, I always get this confused. A die is one, right? Yeah. Or is it the other way around? A dice is one. No, no die is one. Okay. For the die, n5 is the number of times you saw a five. 
And so for the dice, you would have N1, N2, N3, N4, N5, and N6. And that's it. And so you just keep throwing the die, and then you just count after, say, 1,000 tosses, you count how many times was it 1, how many times was it 2, how many times was it 3, and so on. Once we know that, And you can see that what the property that I've also used here is that 8 to the 2 times 8 to the 3 is just 8 to the 2 plus 3, which is 8 to the 5. So when you multiply quantities, um, you just add the exponents if they have a common base. And so we can now use that same property and rewrite this as the probability from j equal 1 to k of theta j to the nj plus alpha j minus 1. Okay. And so the posterior has the, the, the shape of a Dirichlet distribution as well, where now we have this new alpha prime which is just nj plus alpha j. So the posterior is Dirichlet. Okay, so there's one more, a third example for your sort of bag of examples. If the prior is Dirichlet and the likelihood is categorical, then the posterior will also be Dirichlet. Okay. So we know how to compute the posteriors. Let's look at an example, a practical example that's sort of timely as well. Um, suppose you wanted to assess the popularity of uh, um, the president in this country south of the border. Um, I just did a query a few minutes ago. Uh, if, if you type Obama in one of these sentiment prediction uh, um, apps, you might want to know how popular is Obama just by looking at tweets, because now everyone is tweeting Obama this, Obama that, Romney this, Romney that, blah, 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 blah. Um, so here is what you can do. You can take, you can search for uh, a large collection of tweets that have a happy face. Okay? Happy face. And then you say that every tweet that has a happy face is a positive tweet. You then look for a collection of tweets that have a negative, a sad face. And you say that those tweets that have a sad face, they're negative tweets. There will be exceptions. But on the whole, that assumption might not be a bad one. And then maybe I, you know, call on in a straight bar, you call those tweets neutral or whatever. So now we have three classes. You are positive, negative, or neutral. Okay, so what we're going to do is, because ultimately what we want to do is for any quantity, for anything that is talked about on, on uh, Twitter, we want to say how positive are people about that quantity or how negative. For example, if the quantity that people are talking about is the, the word Obama, then you can look at, say, here there's three examples of tweets, and from those three tweets you would like to classify those tweets as being positive, negative, or neutral, and then you just count how many positive, how many negative, how many neutral, and you're able to show a plot like those green and red bars that are being shown there. In this case, there's no neutral. They didn't add neutral to the UI. They just have positive and negative, so they only have two classes. And it's basically saying, most, based on the tweets, um, the popularity of Obama seems to be 
on the safe side. He's looking green right now, so to speak. All right, so we're going to introduce a variable y, and that variable y is going to indicate whether a, twi uh, where, whether a tweet is positive, negative, or neutral. Okay, that's going to be the role of y. So y, again, will be encoded as 100, 010, or 001. So those are the three classes. And y, as you can see just from saying that, will be a categorical variable. We also need to have a way of describing the tweets in, you know, we see words, but how do we encode words? So to encode words, we'll use a vector x. That vector x will have zeros everywhere and will accept where the words occur in the tweet, in which case there will be ones. So for example, suppose that x Suppose that we have a vocabulary of just a few words like cat, rat, sat, um, I, OMG. <laughs> okay. okay. Those are common uh, Twitter terms. Um, and then let's assume that the tweet is, um, let's use my Twitter, and then the DF says, uh, OMG, the cat <laughs> sat, exclamation <laughs> mark maybe. Okay. Now, in my feature vector, and this is actually how you actually do it. It does sound funny, but sadly enough, this is how one in blue. Um, this sentiment 140, you can actually go home now and you can run this and you can check how it does for different things. And the way it's implemented is precisely the way I'm going to describe here. And it's precisely the project. You, you will all get to code this. Um, so what I would do here then is I would say, oh, the words OMG and cat and sat appear. So I go cat, sat, and OMG, and I put a one there. If a word does not appear in my dictionary, so the set of allowed variables is what I'm going to call my dictionary or my set of tokens. And you can imagine that there'll be many words that I'm not going to include there. Because we're not just talking about the words in English. We're talking about people tweeting in all sorts of languages and using all sorts of slang. And all sorts of misspellings. So you can just imagine how huge that is. So we're just going to pick the most popular words. We're also not going to pick words like the, right? Because of the word the, obviously will not help me decide whether a tweet is positive or negative. Because the president sucks or the president is awesome. The word the would not help me. So you probably don't want to consider these words. The exclamation mark I would consider. An exclamation mark is, I see as a symbol that is indicative of positiveness or not. But let's just say I didn't think about my problem carefully so I didn't include the exclamation mark. And so I only had those five words, cat, rat, sad, hi, OMG. And then because I didn't see in this tweet rat and hi, those will get to zero. And that's the ith feature. That's my input. That's my x. I now want to say whether that x is of class y equal 1 or y equal 2 or y equal 3. That's the problem. If you know the, multi -no the categorical distribution, you can do this. Because we can, uh, as I'll show next, we can rewrite this problem just as a problem of learning theta for a categorical distribution. And then we will solve this using 
um, maximum likelihood by differentiating the log likelihood equating to zero, the same step. Um, it's just giving you a, a slight twist, which I'm going to have to add a constraint to ensure that the theta sum to one. So that's going to be a new trick that I'm going to teach you from optimization. And then we're going to do the Bayesian analysis, which is going to be just like what I did in the previous slide, which is uh, uh, you have a categorical likelihood, you multiply it times a Dirichlet prior, and we will obtain a Dirichlet posterior. And that's going to be our answer. And once we have theta, we will see that it's possible then to compute the probability of a new x given uh, theta and x. So the probability of a new y given theta and x. That is, when we see a new tweet, we will able to predict it as being happy or sad. In fact, the way this was trained, this um, web service, is they took, um, I think, one Wait, I'm not going to reveal the total number because <laughs> I, I don't want you to go. I want to keep it as the project, so I don't want to reveal what the solution is. <laughs> That's already saying too much. Um, but I'm going to give you a million tweets. Um, those million tweets, um, half a million will have happy faces, and half a million will have sad faces. So in that case, I will know the labels, what's positive, what's negative. That's what you're going to use to train, in, order, in other words, to estimate theta, either by base or maximum likelihood. Once you know theta, I'm going to give you more tweets, or you can just take any tweets of the web, and you can classify them. At that stage, you're done. You've built a, a classifier for sentiment. Okay, how are we going to do this? We're going to use base rule. So we're going to have two multinomials in this case, one for y and one for x. So now we're going to model the distribution of the, day of the input. Unlike linear regression, here we are going to model the probability of x. And there's going to be two parameters, one for the probability of x, which is theta, and the parameter for the probability of y I don't want to call it theta 2, so let's just call it pi. In particular, and then of course I'm going to use Bayes' rule to compute uh, the probability of y given a, an input x and given the two parameters that we will learn by maximum likelihood or Bayesian inference. And the normalizing, I could also write this as p of y i given pi times the probability of xi given yi and theta divided by, and this is not just application what we've been learning of uh, base rule. This is the sum over yi of p of yi, say yi being of class c. Let's just say that y is, belongs to classes 1, 2, all the way up to capital C. Okay. The normalizing constant is just the quantity that ensures that you have a a probability over y that sums to 1. Go ahead. Um, let, let me show you an example soon in the next slide. Uh, let's, let me first talk about y and then I will talk about the distribution of x. Okay, so Coming back to y, the distribution, the probability of yi given pi is going to be a multinomial from small c equal 1 to big C of pi c indicator of yi 
equals C. So we're just going to use a categorical distribution to indicate uh, the prior probability for the classes. What's the probability that a priori something is positive or negative? There are some candidates for which the sentiment tends to be more positive. Um, if you type, say, or so think of a combination of words, Obama economy, then you, the number of negatives seems to outdo the positives. And so you would expect that pi c is not the same, should not be a half a half. But we're going to allow for different probabilities for each of the classes. So that's the prior. In other words, the probability that yi is of value small c given pi is just equal to pi c. Okay. And the sum of the pi c's over all c's sums to 1. So it's just a categorical distribution. For the x's, I'm also going to use a categorical distribution. Um, but I'm going to make the following assumption. I'm going to assume, oh by the way, one thing I didn't emphasize is I'm going to assume like in this case D is equal to 5. So D is the size of the number of X variables, binary variables. The number of distinct words that I'm using. And so for P of XI given theta and given that I am of a particular class, within a class, I'm going to make the assumption Let me take, back, take you back here. I'm going to make the assumption that from j equal 1, j equal 2, all the way up to j equal d, I have d binary variables. So this is how I'm going to model x. I'm going to model x as d binary variables, each um, you know, being 0 or 1. Okay. So and these binary variables, basically in the text, means is the word present or absent in the tweet? And I'm going to assume that they're either present or absent independently from each other. So I'm going to assume that each of the words are independent of each other. That's a very big assumption because you would think that the words Barack Obama are not independent. Some words do tend, you know, some words tend to kernel with other words. Um, we are, however, going to relax that assumption. We're going to assume essentially that as we split the data into classes, um, essentially what I'm showing here, in one class you will have words that tend to look like this. In another class, you might have words that tend to have a slightly different shape. So those two figures there are on the x-axis, I'm showing you 600 words. And on the y-axis, the frequency of those words. And that's for class 2 and class 1. And so the, the idea is that in different classes, you would see different kind of words. For example, in the class that is positive about Obama, you might see things like health care and you know new hope or whatever liberal on the negative class you might find things like socialist and <laughs> <laughs> I am assuming you can guess the rest okay, so those are my so you'll see different words tend to appear more with the happy faces and with the sad faces. And uh, I'm going to make this assumption, which is a very coarse assumption. 
that these things should be independent. It turns out that even if you make this assumption, you get a classifier that actually works remarkably well. Of course you could do better, but let's for now use the simplest possible thing. We're going to assume that all the words are uh, 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 separate and then what I'm going to show you in the next, show to you in the next class is that the joint distribution of Y given a new input and the parameters can be written in this form where you will have, this is just a prior of a C and this will be a binomial that in the, for each word, for each J and, and it will depend on whether uh, what class you're at, which data point you're at and then a word is on or off. So I'm going to parse this expression for you in the next class what each of these terms are and how I arrive at this but essentially I get a single multinomial at the end of the day. That's just a multinomial. I can group all these terms into a single multinomial and then once we have the model the rest is mechanical. Log likelihood, differentiate, equate to zero and when I do that I'm going to arrive at an algorithm that is extremely simple. The code to build an engine that predicts the sentiment about the quantity in Twitter is this big. It's, it, it just counts and it's completely parallel and it's completely streamed so it's online. Every tweet comes in you can learn. You don't need to store all 